brings to you a distinguished panel of academics and ministers of the faith to engage one of the most critical questions facing black communities, the future of black churches. The question before us is, is the black church dead? Um, and this question was of much debate this past spring when one of our panelists, um, Princeton religion professor Eddie Glaude, wrote an editorial in the Huffington Post proclaiming the death of the black church. Let's give our introductor, Fred Harris, direct a hand. Beginning in a general sense, allowing each of you to take this in whatever direction you want, we presume that because we are all here, at least in some capacity, black churches are living and breathing, doing different sorts of work, would ask for each of you to open up the conversation by identifying and elaborating upon just one thing that you see as a major pressing issue that black churches are currently addressing or need to do a better job of addressing, something that black churches are wrestling with in this current moment. Um, thank you all for having me here. I think about this question a lot in part because of being a historian and looking at the black church through a historical lens, I'd say the, there's one word that I think about a lot and that word is community. Community is what the black church does well in one respect, but what it needs to be doing better than another. And let me explain briefly. Um, and I got to tip my hat to Professor Harris on this one because we've had some conversations on this. If you think about a black church now in an internal community of believers, uh, a community that is located in one church, you can think that there's a pastor, there are people on the, uh, on the board, there are deacons, there are elders, there are members of the church, there's church mothers, and within that community, that community is cohesive, that community of individuals. It's a safe place for people. It's a place where you can tell people your problems. It's a place where you can call out to God. What the problem is, is that most of our churches now are individual churches and they are not collectives as a community within the communities that they live in. And I think this has a lot to do with the kinds of black churches we have now. It's not just a moderate 100 member church or 200 member church. We have mega churches of 10 or 20,000. We have small storefront churches of 100 or 200. But the thing that usually brings people together is that you have a set of shared common goals. During the civil rights movement, it was civil rights. Now that things have sort of dissipated into all sorts of ills of the urban community especially, how do you bring community together? How do you bring communities of churches together? How do you bring coalitions together? Part of the way that that happens is you may make a community of churches or a pastor's coalition or something like that. These things are going away. The second thing, and I think that a big moment that happened that a lot of people probably didn't realize, but it was a very big moment, was the passing of Dorothy Height. And when Dorothy Height passed, what that was was a generation going away. You had the National Council of Negro Women, you had sororities, you had fraternities. All these things have had a connection to black churches. But these organizational structures don't exist anymore. And so where you could have linkages between churches and sororities and fraternities and all these things that make up the black community, they don't exist. Those connections are broken. And because the connections are broken, there's not a sense of community anymore. And how do you continue to perpetuate yourself? How do you perpetuate when your internal church community might be 65 and older and no way to replicate itself? There's no one to come in. How do you continue to perpetuate yourself if you don't have like-minded organizations to come alongside you to help you fight for things in that urban space? How do you continue to perpetuate yourself when your membership is dwindling or your members take their part of their tithes and offerings and give it to that nice TV preacher on TV every Sunday? So you can see that the structures that held everything together don't exist very well anymore. Thank you, uh, Brother Yosef and Brother Fred and, and all of you for um, joining us in what I hope will be uh, a very uh, powerful and, and insightful conversation. So let me try to jump into it rather directly. I think what most churches do very well, um, and I don't know if they need to do better in advertising that they do this well, is that they tend to souls, uh, that folk uh, come in 
uh, to the sanctuary. They come in to experience the power of worship uh, and in communion with others find uh, uh, affirmation and uh, experience as best as possible the grace and mercy of God, which can be for some, and I hope for most, renewing. And so when we think about uh, this priestly function of churches, uh, primarily uh, uh, directed at uh, that dimension of human living that is not reducible to our social and political uh, activity, I think the church uh, or churches uh, do a very, very good job at this. In addition, I think churches, and I'm going to get more excited as we go on. I won't bore you to death, I promise. I'm just kind of tired. Does that make sense? I am tired, though. Um, uh, the, another thing that churches do well, many churches, and you know this because many of you pastor them, is that they stretch a dollar in relation to the needs of their constituents. So many churches are, uh, they have soup kitchens, they have prison ministries, they are trying to address uh, the foreclosure crisis that, uh, that, that's impacting their membership. Uh, they are uh, dealing with folks who are, whose lights have been turned off. They are in interesting sorts of ways addressing the day-to-day -day circumstances and conditions of the folk who come uh, to be nourished spiritually, but they can't be nourished spiritually if they are not living decent lives uh, in the context of, of their day-to-day their -day activity. And I think churches, uh, for the most part, uh, many local churches are doing wonderfully in this regard. I think the question for us to wrap our minds around is what is its national role? How do we think about what it means that Progressive Baptist Convention isn't as powerful as it used to be. How do we think about the function of uh, like-minded persons in the faith uh, addressing directly uh, conditions that are not just reducible to those who sit in the pews? Uh, progressive voices, prophetic voices. I want to make the claim that there's no, def there's no inherent prophetic orientation in any church. I just want to be very clear. To me, it's an oxymoron to think of an institution as prophetic. It's just, and we can debate that. Yeah, we uh, can. I hope we do. <laughs> and so part of what I think is that when we, when we look at it at a micro level, uh, many churches are doing what they've been called to do. Uh, when we think about, uh, and we can talk about this in an interesting sort of way in terms of the challenges that they face. When we think about it at a macro level, I'm, 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 I want to have a, a, a more careful conversation. And we can look at the data and start talking about what that means in its detail. <coughs> yeah, thank you. I'm very glad to, to be here. And let me say first that I... Uh, I speak as a son of the church and a former president of a theological seminary um, and uh, as a former member of the general board of an historic black denomination. I speak as an insider. Um, and so that gives me the right to speak honestly. And uh, more so, it gives me the responsibility um, to speak honestly. Um, Eddie made some, some points that I, I, I think are, are, are good ones. Churches are good at the empathic. Uh, they're good at what they call tending, what we might call tending souls. And he spoke also of spiritual nourishment. Um, but uh, I'm not sure when we, there is a nourishment of uh, the spirit. I'm not sure that I'd call it a spiritual nourishment, though, at the same time. Um, uh, because I'm not, what I see is uh, that there is a, a lack of a, of a tradition of interiority in our churches. Uh, that, what, what I mean by a lack of, of a spiritual, uh, of, of a tradition of interiority, I mean, 
a tradition um, by which we, we inculcate and we uh, engage spiritual disciplines in order to grow in a higher God consciousness uh, rather than taking us to a cul-de-sac of something called faith, that I have faith now, I am saved, but a, a, a spirit, a tradition of interiority that sees us being on a path, on a way to a higher God consciousness. Um, and we get a sense of that, I think, in the Gospel of Luke, I think it's modeled in which when after Jesus has uh, been baptized and initiated into the mission uh, that would take him uh, through his uh, ministry and to his death. Uh, after that, he goes into the desert and he engages in spiritual ministry, uh, ministrations and disciplines to prepare himself. He engages uh, in solitude and in silence and in prayer, but also meditation, because when you're in the desert for 40 days, there aren't but so many words for you to repeat. You must be going inward. And even if it's words, then it becomes mantras, and that becomes meditative as well. He engaged in, in contemplation. It was then, only then, after he had gone through uh, this deep wellspring and time of spiritual preparation, only then would he stand and say, now I am ready. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, which would have to be structural change because then it wouldn't be good news to the poor because some folk would still be poor. Um, uh, liberation to the press, to the oppressed, and, and um, in that sense, he was, he had prepared himself spiritually to be engaged in the world, and in that way he exemplified what I've called holistic spirituality, and in a very unique, Jesus in a very unique proclamation, unique, and the earliest we see is, is unique, and the earliest we see in the documentary evidence anyway, that no one else had conflated this verse from De Deuteronomy and verse from Leviticus to say, love your Lord, your God, your whole, all, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. What I'm getting at is that with the lack of a tradition of interiority, which is different from the tradition of exteriority, which means we're always singing, we're always preaching, we're always performing. Um, we're not listening for the still, small voice of God. I'm suggesting a tradition of interiority is lacking because there's nowhere in our traditional worship where we can really have a meditative time, where we sit in meditation, tearing for the, for the spirit like the old folk used to do. We have moments of meditation at times, but that's usually at the end of the service when the choir is, is, is processing is processing out. I see this as a real lacuna in, uh, in black worship, uh, and I don't see it being addressed as fully as it could be or should be. And quite the contrary, I see it getting worse. We're getting more involved in the performative. Uh, uh, in terms of preaching, it's more important how you say it quite often um, than, than what you're saying. Uh, choirs uh, are deeply into the performative. You don't just sing, but you got to sing. And, you know, preachers talk about burning the house down and tearing the house up and that kind of thing. And so, and so emotionality uh, becomes a proxy for spirituality. I think this is something that we're really going to have to address if we are to, to become, to be as relevant as we could be. If, if, if we can, if we're really to lift up what we call saving souls, um, which becomes something experiential, very experiential um, normatively, uh, rather than it being a creedal uh, affirmation. These are the things I think that, that are really lacking in, in black churches generally. There are some exceptions, of course, but uh, that we're going to have to uh, in, incorporate uh, in the 24th century, for 21st century for churches to really realize the full depth of their promise and to be, in my opinion, much more consistent with the witness of uh, the gospel witness uh, of Jesus. And I end on this note. If I were allowed to, to say two things I was concerned about, the second would be that I'd like to see churches more concerned with reading the gospel and less concerned uh, with all kinds of uh, proclamations about uh, uh, all kinds of creedal proclamations and all kinds of performances of, of piety, be more concerned about reading the gospels. And I didn't say New Testament. I said the gospels, because right now we read Paul and because he's so concerned about personal piety. 
Um, and that takes us off, off the hook. But the prophetic Jesus, witness of Jesus, um, a greater focus on the prophetic men, uh, ministry of Jesus and witness of Jesus is the second thing I would mention if I were allowed to do so. If you were allowed. Yes. I approach uh, this topic, the question of whether the black church is dead, is the black church dead from the perspective of womanist theoethics? And uh, therefore, uh, my womanist analysis has led me to pick up on uh, Glaude's immediate assertion in his uh, proclamation of the black church's death uh, of the black church, and I quote, as we've known it or imagined it. And, uh, and he contends, or rather this, this assertion contends that uh, the communal memory, uh, which undergirds the conceptualization of the black church, uh, corresponds uh, always with what really happened. And what womanist theoethical analysis would suggest is that the conceptualization as the, of the black church does not always correspond with what really happens in black churches. Hmm. In other words, depending on whose experience is solicited Hmm. Afro-Christianity hmm. has never been monolithic. The black community has never been undifferentiated. And black prophetic witness has always been compromised. These things are not new. Therefore, the question for me rightly emerges, how can something be dead if it never really was alive, according to the aforementioned assumptions of its former vitality? Hmm. And still, the black church, though it has never been all, it has confessed to be and been confessed as the image of the black church as all of these things, as a homogenous institution for black people on the side of justice and equality, has undoubtedly served as a significant site, as my co-panelists have already mentioned, where many oppressed have come to believe in the God of justice and the God of love. And although justice and love is not always its reality, it is not always the reality of the black church, this reality of justice and love does not die, even when it faces the trickery of a hegemonic imagination that attempts to make us believe that we are dead, even when life is approximate possibility. Hmm. As one who lives and breathes uh, the ebb and flow of the black church tradition in her everydayness, it appears to me that the critical question that confronts us tonight is not so much whether the black church is dead, but more importantly, how the image of the black church as it has been fictively conceived can be actually realized. That is, how can the black church really live beyond what has been presented as its chronic dis-ease? For example, sexism, heterosexism, pigmatocracy or colorism, ageism, class stratification, and more generally, its apparent obsolete witness in a postmodern world that is no longer dictated by the caustic boundaries of black and white, but rather is colored and nuanced in various shades of gray identities. For the black church tradition, the critical gospel work of affirming life amidst ostensible death requires that we who have given our lives to this high calling must not merely address to seek the women's problem, the woman's problem over there, or seek to address the sexuality problem over there, or the class problem right here. Uh, the, rather, our call is to address a more primary problem that is situated as the crux of all, I would argue, death-dealing body injustice that emerges from within and is too often endorsed by the black church, namely the problem of male normative identity. In other words, who do you think you are is the identity question that the black church must wrestle with in order to propel a reassessment of the black male normativity which functions in black churches toward the end of disregarding the value and the moral agency of all those, male, female, and otherwise, who defy that presumptuous brand of embodied perfection. 
the future of the institution born at the interstices of abolition and enslavement, born in rebellion against the social morality that sanctioned the dehumanization and further demonization of black bodies is dependent then upon its willingness to acknowledge and to respond to the consanguinity of oppressions, which enables the proliferation of moral scapes that inevitably leave somebody out. The black church must instead embrace a body ethic which engenders justice for everybody and not just some of them. Well. <clears throat> I would just add to that. <laughs> <laughs> Ditto. And uh, we'll move on. Um, but it's Zora Neale Hurston uh, that states in, uh, in her book, Their Eyes Are Watching God, there's the scene uh, that I love so very much where uh, Janie and Tea Cake, uh, after the storm in the Everglades, uh, the statement is, it seems as if they are staring in the darkness, uh, but their eyes are watching God. Depending upon who is looking at them, it looks after they've been through this, this incredible storm, um, that they can only be staring in the darkness uh, after all of this dysfunction and challenges. And the reality is for, for the black church is it is a model of, of humanness and dysfunction uh, that struggles with priestly and prophetic, not one or the other, but it's constantly struggling with the priestly and prophetic, constantly struggling with the private, uh, personal, and also the public. The great challenge for as we communicate and talk about the church tonight um, is simply this, not is the church no longer prophetic, um, but the fact that the postmodern church has been overshadowed by prosperity ministry. Uh, if anything is killing or destroying the black church, it might be the word network, but that's a whole other discussion um, in many ways. And so what I feel that uh, the thing that we need to deal with is mm. really talk about the overshadowing of the priestly and the prophetic. And at some point, every church um, within a community context is going to have to struggle with the priestly and prophetic aspect of its ministry. Mm -hmm. um, if you were talking about southern churches in, say, for example, Fort Valley, or we're talking about some place in, uh, in Mississippi, some of the best work in terms of working with uh, black farmers is with the church mm -hmm. or after the BP oil spill because the community context necessitated that we deal with these issues, not because we're standing up and we want to operate out of prophetic tradition, but because our members are struggling with these issues and therefore we must engage these issues. So we move from priestly into the prophetic mode. Um, but hmm. as a result of the deregulation in America um, and the decentralization, we have seen decentralization and deregulation in, in, in the black church in many ways. So the models that we have imagined um, that had an impact, uh, the, the Baptist Convention, they never had an impact. It was an imagine. Mm -hmm. We imagined it. Mm -hmm. um, what happened is, is that people broke from those particular groups and said that we recognize the pressure upon us and our communities to make transformative uh, communication and change within our community. And, and so we, I think that we need to begin to shift how we view the church because we have an imagined, fictitious idea of what the church is. And then the reality is, is that there is always a remnant or a fragment that is prophetic that push pressure upon uh, the church to make a, a shift in a direction. But we never want to make this bifurcation where priestly is bad, prophetic is always good. Um, but it must be both and. It must be the interior and the exterior. And part of the challenge is now we have people who are claiming um, the prophetic, but all they're doing is modeling an unrestricted capitalistic model of ministry. And so that we be, have to have these discussions about what is it to be prophetic, what is it to be priestly. And we are seeing the overshadowing of prosperity ministry and overshadowing of people who are theological exotic dancers and all of that uh, in terms of what they're presenting. And the media in many ways of what we have seen, because Word Network, that's a whole other personal issue I got, um, uh, the, uh, with, with, with such a network such as this, where we think the model is the theological exotic dancing, 
when in actuality the real work of the church is not happening necessarily in the big mega churches, but it's happening in churches that are 75 and less, and people who are doing incredible work on the ground. But is it national? No, because just like all politics are local, all churches are local. And we have to come to, those, come to that idea that most of the movements that we imagine that had these incredible national, had an incredible national fervor and power were always local. The Montgomery Improvement Association is a local group. The Southern Christian Leadership, or it was a, it was a local group. The SNCC, local group. And we have to begin to look from the perspective of local actually is how we go global. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you, panelists, for your opening remarks. I want to, in many ways, uh, Otis, your final comment and clarifying this distinction between the priestly and political is something, the priestly and the prophetic is something that runs throughout, I think, all of our panelists' initial remarks. And this is the kind of dual heritage of black churches as spiritual and social institutions, spiritual and political. And I want to ask a first question about the spiritual and then a second to more clarify this political, this prophetic, and get a couple of you to chime in on either. Um, so if we think about the spiritual first, it's perhaps the less told story, right? This political narrative tends to dominate the way we think about the black church, the, the black church. Uh, Obrey has already suggested some kind of spiritual substance that was at the center of his, his critique, right? This call for interiority. I'm interested to, to, to hear, is it this interiority? Is it, to, is it this a, a truer reading of the Bible? What is the substance of the Christian in the <clears throat> black and Christian as it's being reimagined? So I'd, any, any two takers uh, that might offer us some, some hopeful glimpses or some more further clarification of what the substance is of the spiritual in black churches. Or should I? What it is or what it should be. What it is or what it might be, what it should be. Uh, well, I, I mentioned it, so I'll take a stab. Um, again, I think that <clears throat> the definitive statement, when we talk about the church, as I said, I think one of the problems is that we don't pay enough attention to, uh, take, to the things Jesus said and take them to the nth degree uh, and, and get into the, the depth that we might. He said, I think his paradigmatic statement of spirituality, his holistic spirituality, is love your Lord, your God, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbors, yourself. You can't have a cross without them both. And this was unique to him. Uh, it's so, so spirituality, I think, to be true spirituality, the question is, if we accept that as holistic spirituality, as, uh, as a valid definition of spirituality, in the gospel, uh, gospel context. Mm -hmm. Question is, are we seeing this holistic spirituality in our churches? And I think it's, it's, a, it's a question that can answer itself. Now, the prophetic, the genius of the prophetic mind was that it laid at the, as the plumb line of all our activity, um, personal collective, a uh, justice, mishpat, mm -hmm. justice. Uh, mishpah v'asadaka, uh, justice and righteousness, but these had to do with actions. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, and that, and so when we look at the horizontal axis, love your neighbor as yourself, that is, that is tied to the prophetic witness, our, our, our responsibility. We love our neighbor as ourselves, and we want to struggle against injustice as, as they do. So, not everyone has the same resources, and, and Otis is correct. Not everyone's faced with the same struggle. But in order for it to be holistic spirituality, I'm suggesting it has to be part of the, the teaching. The prophetic must be part of the teaching of the responsibility. And, and in too many churches, it just is not. The teaching ministry of, of, the of the preaching, the proclamation, it cannot just, that always has to be at least taught. It has to be acknowledged of the horizontal axis of what it means to love our neighbors as ourselves rather than just as a, uh, some sentiment gives one a holy hug and then go on your way the, the, the same way. So if we look at it that way, um, as, I remember, as I recall your question, you say, do we see that? Are we seeing that in the church? Well, just what, what is the substance, the source that guides the spirituality? That we're, how do we put some flesh on the bones? I'm suggesting that should be 
uh, that should be one of the basic, if not the basic um, notion of spirituality, guiding us as in the spirit. Spirituality is not what you feel, it's how you act. The only true evidence is how we act in the world. So to the extent that we put more emphasis on the vertical than on the horizontal, to the extent that in my, uh, my understanding that we're not fully um, understanding or practicing holistic spirituality, therefore, uh, I wouldn't say that we, yeah, it's not full spirituality and therefore not completely consistent with the gospel witness in, in my opinion and my reading. Did anybody have a question? I just want to say that it seems to me in agreement with Dr. Hendricks that the substance of our spirituality as uh, the black church would be the gospel and the problem is that that is not the case in so many contemporary church contexts that when we look at the gospel we recognize that there's a mediating ethic at work throughout the gospel there is no priestly without the prophetic Jesus goes mm -hmm. away to you know to restore himself so that he might come back into the streets and do his ministry amongst the people so um, what we see now contemporarily is this you know quasi gospel or this non gospel um, at work in so many church contexts where People just want to be, as uh, uh, one of my professors would often say, so heavenly bound that they're no earthly good. Um, and, you know, are looking just to be, looking for cathartic release within uh, their sanctuary sacred time <laughs> um, instead of really melding uh, the God, or, or, or really adhering to the gospel witness, which, in my opinion, should be. The, the thrust of our spiritual witness. I mean, I, I think one way to concretize it would be to think about this, this extraordinary moment in Al Rabito's slave religion, when the slave Mort, who prayed three times a day, was confronted by the slave master. And the slave master said, if you do not stop praying, I will blow your brains out. And the slave res Mort responded, you may own my body, but God owns my soul. Now, some, for some people, that's an otherworldly gesture. Right. But right. in the context of this, this, this account, it has this worldly implications, yes? It is reflective of a relationship with God that fundamentally reorients the self and short circuits a master slave relationship, which leads more to be maladjusted to a particular political social, economic relation. But what's interesting is that too many people come out of churches and seem to be very much adjusted to the relations that define the world. And so if people aren't saying, you must be drunk, right? Remember in Acts, right? They must be drunk. They must be full of a new wine. If folk aren't actually seeing Christians, in my view, and I know some people say, well, how in the hell is he talking about this? pragmatic naturalists, Catholic rearing folk. These are some of the things that have been said to me by Christian folk. Folk who've been taking me to the altar but not for prayer. Um, and the sense is that there is this notion that one could actually encounter the power and un ineffable experience of God's grace and not be transformed and enter into the world in such a way that you could be all right with the way it is, then it seems to me that calls for an indictment. It calls for a response. And you can, the response has to be, at least within the Christian context, on Christian grounds. Right? And it seems to me that, that if we wanted to give some substance, it seems to me if we want to measure the substance of a Christian faith, it's your relative maladjustment to the world in which you actually And I think is. that you, you raise a good question, uh, Eddie, because one of the issues is that um, within the Christian context, we, we have a lot of faith. We have a lot of doctrine, but our faith is not connected to love, and love is transformative. Mm -hmm. So uh, one thing that I heard William Sloan Coffin said is that you have to be careful uh, when you're talking about faith or critiquing people that have deep faith, because they have deep faith. But the problem is that they don't have love. When you have deep faith without love, then you create doctrine that is destructive. Mm. And so people who've been taking you to the altar have deep faith about what they believe, hold on to what they believe. But love causes you to wrestle with issues. 
And so that becomes the central aspect of the gospel, mm. the idea of love. And that becomes the love ethic that we within the church have not engaged because one, within the American context, we don't like the word love because love deals with forgiveness, love deals with compassion, and all these other ideas. Um, we like faith because faith allows us to operate out of a doctrine that can be rigid in terms of our connection to people. So I, I don't have to shift with my faith, but love causes me to change the way I look at my faith. Mm. And that is what the gospel demands. So, so mm. here you have this context of Jesus who is now saying that I want you to operate with this love ethic, but yet we are preaching not love, or better yet, we preach Jesus, but we don't preach what Jesus pre preached, mm. is really what is happening. And, and so there needs to be in many ways for us to bring back the love ethic central to, uh, to the ministry uh, that then allows us to develop on the interior and the exterior. Mm -hmm. um, because you have a lot of people uh, who are incredibly prophetic, but yet they, have, they are spiritually anemic. Mm -hmm. um, and so they are the people that can be an architect for a movement, but yet in their personal lives, they are destructive. Mm -hmm. And then you have people who are so high and mighty, but they don't want to do anything about shifting things in a public nature. So, so there's always the tension, and essentially, in humanity, we have a dysfunctionality that we have to uh, come to grips with, and that, I, that love ethic is one way that we begin to deal with those tensions. If I could ask, add one qualifier, Anthea, and add, if, if you could weigh in, and, and if, if there's a way to connect this, all of our departures for the spirituality have been the Bible, right, or have been the Gospels. But I'm wondering, right, Otis, in your initial comment, you claim Zora Neale Hurston, mm -hmm. Ebony, you make appeal to a womanist ethic. Is the Gospel the only sacred text? So in, in particular, Anthea, in your work on Kojic women, right, what are the texts that are informing the spirituality then that animates outwards? Is it, is it just the Gospel? And I appreciate that claim as a call for Christian faith, but what are the other texts that we hold sacred? I said God's grace. So I didn't say that. What, what, oh, what text do we hold sacred? The, um, the text of discipline. Uh -oh. Okay. And I was sitting here listening to a conversation. It's, it's very rare that I'm quiet, okay? But if I'm quiet, that's a dangerous thing. Uh -oh. <laughs> um, Hello. I, I'm, I'm minded to think about a whole other constituency altogether, which are a lot of my friends. And... Um, apparently to the Pew Forum is a lot of people too, and that is all these people who claim to be spiritual but not religious, and the people who are black and Christian and hate the church and don't want to go back no more. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, okay? mm -hmm. And you see, what happens is, is that this text of no love, but we're going to preach to you about the faith, mm -hmm. has driven a whole bunch of That's people right. up out That's the right. door of the church. That's right. Okay? And I don't want to take a show of hands in here, because I know some of y'all love God in here, but you ain't trying to go in no church. It's, there you go. Okay, so, you know, this is the thing. We, we have to get real about what's really happening. And what's really happening is we got some black churches with folks sitting in them, but the people that we need to have in them, younger people, the people who keep these things going, they're not there because they are sick of the crap. They are sick of being told what to do, how to do it by people who are hypocritical, who don't have love for nobody, who ain't trying to share their wealth with nobody who will bother to tell you that your sexuality and your personhood is not worthy because they are the ones up in the pulpit and you are down there. Mm. Now, that's not everybody. I'm not here to critique, you know, who's good and who's bad. But we need to realize that there are a large group of African Americans right now who ain't never going to set foot in a black church again because of how they got raised and what happened to them. And we need to contend with those people who have not been loved, who did not hear anything about the gospel that was good, and decided that the moment they could get away from mama and grandmama, they were gone. All right. Just saying. She had to get that one out. Is it? Well put, well put. To, to, to shift just slightly, not to assume that the spiritual and the social are mutually exclusive, but... To move from that first half, thinking about the spiritual legacy, to this question of the prophetic and the political, and many, as many of you even pointed out, that this over-determined political narrative does not take full recognition of the work that black churches has, have always done, right? Y'all ready to go. Still, we are calling, right, even in, in Eddie's initial, 
uh, post on Huffington in the spring was the reassertion of the prophetic, right? So now if we, we've wrestled with the spiritual a little bit, it's shortcoming and insights, how it, what sources inform it. What about the prophetic? What then does the prophetic look like on, in the post-soul moment, right? Ob- arguably, prior to Dr. King, this image of the pre- prophetic, even on our flyer for this evening, there was a sense of shared interest that uh, Anthea directed us to in her initial comments, right? Now, in a post-soul moment, in a post-civil rights moment, competing interest, diversification, class divide, what does the prophetic look like in that milieu? Let, let me just really say really quickly, and I, and, and, and I just really want to say really, there, there are three different sorts of points that animate the, the Huff Post piece, right? First is a historiographical claim that we've got to wrap our minds around, that the histories of African-American religion have been dominated by liberal religious modernist, or what we might call religious modernist accounts. So there's a reason why we tell the story of African-American religion in a particular sort of way. We think about all those University of Chicago theses. Mm-hmm, we think mm-hmm. about all of those folk who were particular kinds of, 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 of historians and sociologists participating in particular kinds of networks, writing, story, writing histories about African-American churches and accounting for those that fall, fell outside their bounds, right? Outside, bound, outside the bounds, right? So when we think about why we haven't told and why we're just now beginning to tell a thick story about African-American fundamentalism, why we're now just beginning to tell a thick story about the cross-fertilization, right, of this very interesting religious development after the Scopes trial and how African-Americans were deeply implicated in that has something to do with the kinds of stories we told mm-hmm. about our religious Community, our religious communities that we're just beginning to break open. That story has been driven by a particular theological orientation with a set of particular normative claims about how churches ought to function. That's the first class, right? Second thing is that we need to deal with the battle between Reverend Ike and Dr. King. Ike won hmm. <laughs> on a certain level, right? We're going to get there. We're gonna, we, we... No, I'm not saying he won, but I'm, I'm being dramatic, provocative, right? It's like that moment in Car Wash when Daddy Rich is coming to get his shoes shine and, and the man who shines his shoes and behind, sitting behind him are images of Dr. King and Daddy Rich, right? It gives us a set of a kind of complexity. Prosperity gospel isn't new. Du Bois talked about it in 1903. We know it was Prophet Jones. We can just begin to start to Wallace Bess's piece, a recent piece in, um, yeah. in Huffington Post gives us a it sense is. of the complexity of this moment. Right. So part of what has to happen is really a kind of fundamental understanding that we've told ourselves a story that flattens the complexity, that the myth is in fact a myth, but it has real consequences in how we think about black church functioning. That's the first claim with a whole bunch of subsets. The second claim is that prophetic energy cannot be inherited, in my view. People have to, you just can't be, you just, I'm raised in the church by definition, I have prophetic energy, I have the prophetic voice in me. No, I want to suggest that folk have to, that the prophetic voice has to be found in the place where one's feet rest. And what is required in this moment is not so much a kind of recitation of the power of the black church, qua black church. What is required is a reimagining, uh, an insistence on its relevance in relation to current problems. So when those folk in the context of the great migration reimagined the church, when King pushed out of the pulpit but insisted on reimagining, we have a moment that requires us not simply to just hearken back to a tradition. We have to step, and so to give it content is to prescribe. What I want to suggest is just open up the space so that people can give voice to what it can be and to what it perhaps is. So that's, if we could respond to that, what is, how do we give voice to the prophetic in this moment? How do you all give voice in your work, in your ministries, to our pastors as well? What does the prophetic look like in a post-civil rights moment? Well, let me, let me say, I think that very fundamentally, um, and, and Eddie, your, your points uh, are a good one, and uh, notwithstanding your points, I think that much more fundamentally, much more fun- fundamental to the whole enterprise is the question of whether we really have given serious weight and consideration to prophetic discourse. Mm. 
in uh, our church discourses. Um, there are many people who in church, when they hear you talk about prophetic, they think you're talking about foretelling. Have no idea that the major part of prophetic discourse is forthtelling, is indicting uh, the, the powers that be. So I think the first step is to try to make this uh, a normative uh, part of, of our discourse, of, and that this is an important moment, and it's not just left up to the Martin Luther Kings. It's important that all of us know how basic the call to, to uh, be on the lookout for opportunities to do justice or, or, or situations that call for justice, just to be done, uh, justice to be done, how fundamental that is to our faith. I think that's the first step. Now we can talk about how does this look, and I think that's, that's really important, but until that becomes a much more important part of our discourse, we're going to, it's going to be fragmented. Um, we're going to have, and we're going to have people, I won't mention names, we're going to have pastors, like one who's, uh, very much discredited this credit in this in this moment, but he is a prosperity preacher, and he's saying a whole lot of crazy stuff. Yet he can talk about taking on the mantle of Martin Luther King, and there's no hue and cry because the prophetic is that? not part of. You want to mention his name? I'm not going to say his name. I'm not going because it's not a it's long. It's a broader issue. It's it, not just about. It's not just about this 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 person. No, that because that's a long way away. <laughs> so I'm not going to say that. But you see my. Page, the, that current issue as part of a broader set of questions and how we imagine. But until we do that, it's going to be fragmented. And we're going to have folk thinking that they are being prophetic and when they're talking about, talking about taking on King's mantle, when they're doing a whole lot of foolish, a whole lot of performative stuff, it's a whole lot of, it's, it's a whole lot of prosperity gospel stuff, it's a whole lot of getting people, uh, making people think it's about, uh, you know, what do you think, it's, it's about praising with your lips all the time and forgetting about what you do with your limbs. If it's not Going, doing the holy dance, and it, it makes, doesn't it matter. Makes, it makes sense, though. It, it makes sense because to appropriate the image of Dr. King fits within Americanization. Yeah. And, yeah, that's and, true. And, and the appropriate, that's, what, that's, what, that's why Reverend Ike uh, fits with an American narrative so well. Mm. That's why prosperity gospel fits with an American. The prophetic narrative does not fit with the American ideal. So the prosperity gospel and Donald Trump, P. Diddy, and everybody else, they have the same narrative. And, and the prophetic narrative, when it is truly prophetic, does not fit within the mythos of America. That's why it must be proclaimed by right. us as right. a and part any, of our normative practice. Right, and any person who has made that proclaim, you're always a remnant. Mm. So you are, you are always turned out by your own people. Absolutely. So you go to Riverside and you say, I'm gonna speak out against the war. A speech that could be used today just changed some figures. Um, and you are turned out by your best friends who say that I can no longer support you because you are supposed to be a local civil rights leader, uh, not dealing with a poor people's campaign. You are turned out by your own people when you become radicalized, i.e. Du Bois. Um, and so that the, the, the prosperity narrative, which we're giving a lot of energy to, is very American. Um, the prophetic narrative uh, is always going against the mythos of America. And anytime you go against the mythos of America, you have to raise the question, are you willing to be killed as a result of it? Not necessarily physically, but your ministry, who you are, your teaching, what you, you will be assassinated uh, in some form or fashion just for taking a position. And the reason I know this, because our church was assassinated mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because of prophetic stands that we take um, as a result of that. Just because someone of, of, of color was gonna go in the white, the only thing they could find on him was, well, we'll find a message from your minister, um, which is a whole other thing. But uh, that becomes the particular narrative. The prophetic narrative demands a spiritual life, an, an interior and exterior that raises the question, a question fundamentally of love. How does everyone live out their full humanness with, as a child of God? Mm -hmm. and, and the texts that we borrow from, not just the gospel, but the texts that we borrow from are also texts that come out of our collective narrative as African people, a narrative that demands space. Let me give you an example, simple story of, of, of an older woman, um, who had several children, 
One child uh, was same ginger loving. Another child you know, um, was, you know, made some money on Wall Street. Another child, um, uh, let's, I think, was divorced or something of that nature. Well, the children came home, and um, the, there, was, there was some fundamentalism in the mind of the Wall Street guy. And he did not want this same gender loving brother at the same table. And so they're all arguing about the table, saying who could be at the table, this, that, and the other, till mama stood up and said, You must understand, first off, it's my table and you're in my house. And you are all my children. Don't you ever put someone out of my house because you have, you have a right to sit at the table. You didn't make the food, you didn't create the house, you are privileged to be in this house. Now, I don't care if y'all don't get along, but when you're in my house, you're at least going to struggle in dialogue. And that becomes the best image of what we struggle as in terms of a community. Drawing from, and again, that, that, that Hurston narrative, I draw from Hurston, um, because she gives so much black theology in what she does, because she, she deals with the folk religion that many in the academy we diss as being minstrel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She says the sanctified church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you about High John the Conqueror that actually gives information of how we live out as human beings. And that becomes a challenge for us. Can we actually get back to a center of a culture, of other narratives, and then again going back to this love ethic that becomes central to who we are supposed to be? I just really quickly, Otis, there's a, I was just thinking as you were laying out that powerful story about mama slapping Benita mm. and a raisin in the mm -hmm. sun, popped her right in the face. You will, as long as you in my house, you will believe in, I remember James Baldwin's stepfather asking him, was the boy saved? And James Baldwin said he was Jewish and the father popped him in the mouth. So we have to be careful when we invoke traditions because they contain within them disciplining mechanisms that police the boundaries of, of, of expression. But they also have I'm, I'm, a I'm narrative of love, too. I'm, that's what I'm saying. Yes. I'm just saying, let's put them side by side. Oh, we keep, we keep them together, but you know, they yeah, also absolutely. have a narrative of love. And we've been waiting for a little while. Yeah, I, well, I just want to really point out one very big thing. When we talk about the prophetic, it is always this notion that we have to talk to immediately go to King or to mm -hmm. something else. Mm -hmm. Can somebody be prophetic that's sitting in a storefront church with 20 people? Right. Hello. I mean, it can, right. can we have the prophetic without it being a figure? Because you see, what I think is happening, mm -hmm. and, and this problem with, you know, hmm. the black church, put in the quotation mark, is that because these voices that are prophetic don't, are, are not heard anymore. See, it was the problem with Jeremiah Wright. When you say, God damn America, nobody had heard that in so long, it freaked everybody out. And then it was on a, it, it was, it, well, you, you heard it at your church, you heard it. But, but nobody else, I mean, but even black people were like, oh my God, you not know? Chicago. And, and not Chicago, but everywhere else they were. Do you know what I'm saying? So this, this voice has not been heard. And the second part is that if you're going to be prophetic, it is not about individual sin. That's the okay? point, right? That's this point. is about the corporate thing. Right. It's about all y'all, like we say in Texas. Not just one, but all y'all. This is, this is where all we're at, everybody. This thing is wrong. So, so for me, when I start to think about what would be prophetic right now, it would be really prophetic if like, a bunch of black churches got together and said, we need to get out of this damn war. Mm. How many black men and women we got fighting over there? Can we, can we get out of this war? Can we, can we just back out of this thing? See, nobody wants to be prophetic because we finally have a black president, and nobody don't want to call him out neither. Okay, so I'm, I'm going there, okay? I'm going there tonight. So, so this, is, this is the thing. We, we are so happy to have him that we will let him do whatever he wants to do. And maybe that's not right. But we let Bush do whatever he wanted yeah, to do. That's right, we did too. And, and you know how they let Bush do whatever they want to do? Because they took payoffs. Well, but at the same time, oh, when, oh, when oh, the church oh, is... Oh, 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 Fred, 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 Ebony's been waiting oh, patiently oh, for a yeah. moment. Did you... Well, I, I, to, to Dr. Butler's point, I mean, <laughs> when we talk about <laughs> being post-civil rights, you know, that can be confusing to so many, right? Because chronologically, yes, we are post-civil rights movement, and yet we really are not post-black freedom. 
um, when we look to what's happening on the micro level in our communities and how we are disproportionately represented in every, uh, just about every uh, negative uh, statistic that there is, we are still enslaved to a lot. And so how can we be prophetic then? How are we prophetic to your question in light of what's happening not necessarily in Raisin in the Sun, not necessarily in Hurston's novels, but what's happening right here on our streets, mm -hmm. in, the, in the homes of the people that we serve. Right. Um, and so to recognize, again, just using the language post-civil rights that while chronologically we are, right. we are still uh, engaged in a black freedom movement even as a black man sits in the White House. Yo, so can I just, I just man, please just say this. I, I, I just want to say it and get it, and get it out. So much of the problem is, is that the, our churches are so ensconced and mired in the performative. It's everything is a daggone performance. And you know, like so Daniel. much energy, so much energy is put into the performance every Sunday. There's so, there's so little energy put in and uh, in, 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 uh, into social resources. There's so much energy, so many resources that are, that are squandered and that are lost. So we want to talk about, not about people getting payoffs as much, I mean, directly as much as the payoff comes from folk are having a whole lot of fun and talking about how deeply spiritual calling the church and coming out not transformed, just changing the way they feel for a couple of days, then they got to go back and re-up again. Now, come on, let's, let's get to it. I want to bring in a... a a question. We can think of the performative as both a blessing and a curse, if we will, and, and a comp more complicated, right? Well, yeah. But I, but I want to bring in a question from the audience. And the microphone, the, the, just so you know, the cordless mic is not working, so that's why I'm raising these. But our, someone in our audience and, and several point to this question as a particular concrete issue that you all are calling black churches to deal with is the question of class. So where are black churches in the economic crisis, right? Soledad reimagined her documentary to focus on debt, right? Many of you have pointed to questions of wealth or lack thereof and these disparities across society. Where are black churches on, and I'm not saying they're not anywhere, I'm asking where are they concretely? How are black churches dealing with the class reality in this post-civil rights era and the particularities of the more recent economic recession? I want, to, I want to try and kind of get at that in, in two different ways. One, one is that when we talk about uh, the black church and the work of the black church um, and all of the overshadowing of those things that we consider to be negative, um, which is true, I agree with all that, but what is tragic is that when you do have people who are coming together, right. as we've had 300 churches came together, stand against the war, right. 300, another 300 churches dealing with this issue of poverty, they don't get the mic. They, they don't get the mic at all. And, and it's so challenging. No one wants to talk with them um, when they take a prophetic stand. And the reality is, is the prophetic is always a remnant. They are always on the margin. And we would love it to be the center, but if it becomes a center, then somebody else is going to have to critique it from the margin um, if it becomes a center. But the prophetic has always, always been, always been. And so the issue of class is one of the issues that the church has challenges with because it's so Americanized. Yes. So we still have churches that, ha that are certain colors, certain classes, uh, certain you have to have certain degrees to be a part of, all of that. And some of the amazing work is really going on in storefront churches, people who will never come into Union Theological Seminary because they are dealing with the issue of poverty on a day-to-day yeah. -day basis. Yeah in a very real way. Children who just are straight up hungry. They can't learn because their bellies ache. But within a privileged church, which many people have attended, a privileged church, those are stories that you see on television or you hear from the pulpit. Yeah. Yes. 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 Speaking um, from the perspective of Abyssinian Baptist Church, which is often looked upon as, uh, to use uh, Reverend Moss's language, a privileged church. I just want to push back a little bit on that uh, because those are not, I mean, those are not just stories for, for many of us. Uh, 
we actually are a congregation that is interclass, mm -hmm. although uh, it, you wouldn't necessarily know it from the outside. We are a, class, we are a, a congregation that is made up of those who are poor and those who are very rich. Um, and we all come together. And in the context of our ministry, we are touching hands on flesh, the flesh and blood realities of the community around us through not only, you know, the mm -hmm. development corporation as right. a, an institutional entity, but through the folk in the pews who mm -hmm. actually, you know, give, you know, clothe those who are naked, who actually feed those who are hungry. And so I don't want to, although we recognize that um, many black churches and many churches are set apart uh, just by the mere privilege of having a sanctuary, right, are set up apart from those who are really the oppressed of the oppressed, even though that is, 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 is factual, there are those contexts wherein you are, you are, you have persons who are really touching those flesh and blood realities. Mm -hmm. And so I don't want to discount. Absolutely. Ab ab absolutely. Absolutely. Right. absolutely.